Hello, Euro nerds, and welcome to this first part in the section of notes called Europe 1919 to 1945. This is going to cover, of course, the what we call the in between the wars time period in European history. And this specific section is going to go from the beginning of the notes to just before the economic downturn of the late 20s and early 30s. All right, so let's get going here. All right, so overall, the section note's going to cover, uh, not just this part, all the parts for this section, uh, is going to basically be the economic developments, social changes, a lot of social changes in, in the especially 1920s period, um, changes with international relations. Eventually, we'll talk about characteristics of fascism and then go into Mussolini's fascism in Italy, of course, Hitler's fascism in Germany, uh, and eventually the Spanish Civil War, and then ending with... Uh, World War II both causes some of the major developments, battles of World War II, and then possibly most importantly, the results of World War II, which of course will include the Holocaust. Okay, uh, so first I'm going to say pause this recording, absorb everything that is on this uh, slide here. It's a good review of what happened um, to women in Europe because of World War One. So again, pause this, and then we're going to keep going here. All right, so uh, we technically already covered this in the aftermath of World War One slides, but I'll just kind of do it again a little bit quickly. Uh, so right at the very end of the war, the negotiations Treaty of Versailles, uh, there is a failed communist uprising in Germany. And it will be repressed uh, by the new German government. And the new German government is basically going to see the 1920s as this period of political and economic instability. So yeah, that previous rebellion was crushed, but it's still going to be a pretty pervasive theme in the 1920s, political and economic instability. Speaking of economic instability, this is probably going to be one of your best examples besides the Great Depression. So, as we know, the Treaty of Versailles, Germany had to pay about $33 billion worth of reparation payments to the Allies. And about today's money, that's about half a trillion dollars. And the only way Germany could pay these payments was through hard gold, or foreign currency. Uh, the Allies would not accept actual German currency uh, to pay that off. So Germany is basically using up a good portion of their gold, so they start purchasing foreign currency to pay off their reparations. Well, whenever a country buys foreign currency, that leads to inflation, which is the devaluing of your currency. So like right now, as I record this in 2022, the United States is at about a 6 to 7% inflation rate, which is one of the highest ones we have seen in about 30, 40 years. Uh, what Germany experiences between 1923 and 1924 is hyperinflation. It is enormous. So uh, when Germany can't pay their reparations, they start buying a bunch of foreign currency. France and Belgium occupied the industrial region of Germany called the Ruhr, and that is basically to force these reparation payments in kind. So basically, uh, France and Belgium are going to be using like coal payments uh, and other industrial products as effectively payments instead of currency, instead of gold. So this is going to now lead to the German government to print even more money because now there's a general strike. When you print more money, your currency will become worthless. German currency became so worthless, you literally had to go to the bakery with a wheelbarrow full of money. Germany starts uh, printing money every single day in larger and larger denominations to the point where some of the smallest bills they had were one billion German marks. Literally one note was a billion German marks. So effectively, the German currency became absolutely worthless. So when I click on this link, this is going to show you some photographs of just what German money was being used for because you couldn't really use it to buy anything. This woman right here, she's literally shoving it into the furnace because it was cheaper to burn money than it was to buy timber, to buy coal. This little kid here is playing some type of block game with stacks of German money. And my personal favorite, they made a kite out of German money. So clearly this is an issue. So once again, the theme is going to be, if your economy sucks, people are going to vote 
for political parties that are going to promise change. People like hearing simple solutions to complex problems. So eventually, this hyperinflation crisis is fixed by 1924 into 25. Why? Because the United States actually stepped in uh, because the U.S. Was, banks were connected to France and Belgium because they owed U.S. banks money because of World War I. So if America ain't getting money, they're going to step in and try and fix the process. So the U.S. created this something called the Dawes Plan that basically made it easier for Germany to pay off their reparation payments. And uh, Germany is going to basically get rid of their hyperinflated devalued currency, create a new one, start from scratch, uh, and that will allow them to rebuild the new currency, which is exactly what you have to do in hyperinflation crises. Uh, regardless, this is how we need to interpret the hyperinflation crisis, is the fact that this is going to lead to more political instability because this is economic instability, and we're going to see more and more people um, starting to support the extreme left and the extreme right. Communists on the extreme left, and fascists on the extreme right, of course, being the Nazi party, which is still fairly small in 1923-1924. So the Weimar government is going to have to tackle uh, consistent political crises, relatively consistent economic crises, uh, until eventually Hitler is able to take power. So uh, for this, I would say pause the recording, read this on your own. Same thing, pause the recording, read this on your own. This is going to detail a few sections of the Dawes plan. Okay, so the next section is uh, loosely, uh, connect, well, it's connected to the previous stuff of German hyperinflation. So the, uh, the College Board has this really uh, small section in their key concepts guide of what you know, content we need to teach as APR teachers called the Spirit of Locarno. Basically, this... Um, gradual decrease in tension between the major powers of the world in the 1920s. Uh, so this is just going to get into a little bit of the specifics with it. So <clears throat> partly because of the German hyperinflation crisis, uh, the French and the Belgians occupying the Ruhr in response to Germany not being able to pay those reparation payments, uh, the major powers come to Lake Geneva in Switzerland to kind of hash out some deals to kind of like assuage these tensions that are between them. So they basically start really simple. This is actually kind of a common thing in foreign relations, is if someone wants to like say they're assuaging, assuaging, uh, tensions they're going to say we promise that the border that is your country we're never going to violate it they just say your country's borders are your country's borders and we promise never to touch them uh, as you can probably tell from the tone of my voice those aren't really legitimate you know promises because those can be violated at any point in time um so it's just like kind of like a goodwill kind of statement doesn't actually mean that much so an example of this uh of this more goodwill stuff is going to be the league of nations which purposely excluded germany when it was created in 1919 has now invited germany to join so again that's you know a slight positive for the 1920s uh, eventually hitler's just gonna simply remove themselves from the league of nations but it is what it is and my personal favorite of all of the locarno trees spirit of locarno is this one, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, 1928. So 65 countries, 65 countries, including Germany, all agreed to condemn war as a means of solving international relations. In layman's terms, they basically outlawed warfare in 1928. Yes, I'll say that again. They outlawed warfare in 1928, and Germany also signed that. Again, from the tone of my voice, is that really going to happen? No, of course not. It just makes them think that people aren't going to be nice. It's not going to happen if you know anything about, you know, 1930s and 1940s. So regardless, um, overall, the spirit of Locarno is just this decrease in tensions between the major powers of Europe and some major powers of the world. All right, uh, General Strike 1926. So this is very rarely come up in the AP exam, but so I'll go over this just in a general sense. So, 1926, British coal miners are unhappy uh, because of low wages, longer working hours. It's kind of like the same problems we've always been hearing since the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. 
So there was a massive strike in Britain. One and a half million workers uh, refused to work. Interesting enough, it's uh, not just the initial workers who were angry. It's like a bunch of them. So we would actually call that a sympathetic strike. Where, like, besides the one company's or, uh, workers who are unhappy, it's like the entire stinking union. Uh, so that's a sympathetic strike. So a million and a half workers go on strike in Britain. Now the British government has to respond because they basically feared that this could lead uh, to a potential socialist revolution because socialism, of course, socialists are going to be involved in this. So basically, the government cuts a deal with the union leadership. And the deal was much more in favor of the British government because right after this strike, look at what Parliament passes. They forbid all sympathetic strikes. So you can't go on strike because another company's workers are going on strike. You can't have mass picketing. So again, this is going to be a slight hit to the worker union movement. And generally speaking, um, this is going to happen under conservative governments, especially in British history. So this occurred during a Tory-led or a conservative-led uh, government in Britain. All right, uh, now we're going to change gears to some social history. This stuff's actually kind of fun. So I want you to think back to your eighth grade social studies class. You hopefully talked about the flapper movement in the 1920s in the U.S., uh, the jazz movement in the United States. And interestingly enough, uh, we actually saw a pretty similar um, series of changes, socially speaking, in Europe in the 1920s, especially in Paris. So uh, the overall mindset I would like you to have is something called like the age is the age of anxiety. We're still in it. So like the age of anxiety is basically early 1900s going into the 1920s. So like early 1900s, people are kind of getting anxious that this idea of progress eventually is going to like not be progress anymore. And guess what's going to happen? World War One, which kind of shatters this myth of continual Western progress, socially and politically speaking. Then post-World War I, people are like coming to terms with what just happened, with 20 million people being killed during the war, the economic destruction that occurred because of the war, um, the social dislocation that occurred because of the war. So we're going to see this age of anxiety progress into the 1920s as well. So the uh, the French term, and again, I don't speak any French, so my pronunciation of French is horrific, les enfoyers, uh, the crazy years. This is going to sound really similar to uh, America in the 1920s. So again, our context is that disillusionment by World War One, the age of anxiety per se. Additionally, don't forget about the influenza epidemic, the Spanish flu of 1918 uh, to 1920, which took between the lives of 50 to 100 million people worldwide. That was in addition to the casualties uh, from World War One itself. So as we know from World War I, women have now kind of been liberated more on um, the social expectations to a certain extent. Uh, so when women are working in traditionally male-dominated weapons factories, that's a change. And, you know, part of this change is going to actually move into the art of the 1920s. So a new type of art we're going to talk about right here is called avant-garde or more experimental art. Art. And uh, as you're going to probably notice, it's going to go more irrational. You know, when I talk about the 19th century, I talk about this teeter totter between rationalism and irrationalism. Post World War I, it's going to continue down the irrationalist line um, where people are not going to be making artwork that's necessarily pleasing to the eye. They're going to purposely try and go against the grain. So for us, uh, we're just going to highlight a few of them here. Coco Chanel, uh, we'll look at a bit. Pablo Picasso is going to be huge. Of course, Salvador Dali, arguably one of the most famous of the surrealist painters, maybe along the lines, uh, along with uh, Frida Kahlo, Mexican-German painter in Mexico. And then, uh, dancer-wise, we're going to have a focus on Josephine Baker, who was an American expatriate or expat who moved to Paris and is basically going to bring uh, jazz and the styles of dance to uh, Paris, and it's kind of fascinating to see that, you know, cultural diffusion to use that ninth grade global one buzzword. Uh, some other, if you're a, you know, if you're a big reader, you might recognize uh, some of these people on here, like F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, Man Ray. They all lived in Paris at the same time. Cole Porter, uh, which is like fascinating. <clears throat> all right, so let's talk about Josephine Baker. 
so as the caption here reads, she's an American-born black woman, and uh, she eventually le leaves the United States uh, almost as essentially as a protest of the segregation that occurred in the American South, and she moves to Paris, she becomes French, officially gains citizenship, and she's going to basically take the jazz movement of the United States and transplant it to Paris, where she was quite frankly, one of the most popular paint, uh, painters, uh, dancers in Paris, and she became known for bringing the Charleston in particular to Paris. So again, that style of dancing is a little bit more chaotic, it's more irrational than what their, um, Europe is used to, so again, it's along the lines of avant-garde, age of anxiety. And uh, she became so instrumental in French Parisian society, uh, she's kind of just kickstarted an entire artistic movement dance wise. So, uh, just last year, again, I'm recording this in 2022, uh, Josephine Banker became the first black woman to be inducted into France's pantheon. And that's the pantheon is where France buries all of its national heroes, and she's the first black woman to get that. So, she's a pretty fascinating figure um, in history. So again, the videos don't really show up too well when I do these recordings, uh, but I do recommend checking this one out. Uh, if you just Google Josephine Baker and BBC on YouTube, it's a really cool uh, focus on her that I recommend viewing. All right. Okay, so uh, going along the lines of the 1920s, you know, the flapper movement. Well, they French did have flappers, they just didn't call them that. Uh, of course, because it's French, they called them les garçons. Uh, so very similar to the American flappers where women start dressing a little bit more androgynously. Um, they're going to be wearing clothes that don't act that like don't accentuate the traditional feminine shape. Um, they're trying to accentuate actually a more boyish or a little bit more masculine shape. So um, the styles of hair start getting shorter and shorter. The dresses get shorter. They can starting to see ankles, maybe even a kneecap. So again, for the time period, yes, that is a significant change. Uh, and again, we're going to look at that more from the age of anxiety, you know, post World War One perspective. So the person to really know when it comes to Le Garçon, uh, the flapper movement, of course, is going to be Coco Chanel. And this is really where she becomes uh, super famous. So what are these flapper Le Garçon uh, women doing here? Well, one, dancing is changing. So in the 1920s, people are starting to dance face to more, much more face to face, very close. It's getting a little bit more risque. The Charleston, again, is more erratic, more irrational. And it's combined with jazz. Uh, again, an American based, African American based style of music brought over really by Josephine Baker. Women are now recreationally drinking alcohol and tobacco. Traditionally, women did not really drink alcohol and tobacco at least, or smoke tobacco in public at least. And here you have Coco Chanel taking a photograph with a cigarette in her mouth. So, um, pretty significant changes in the expectations of women's public lives. Uh, women could now drive in cars. Again, when cars are just made, it was a male-dominated sphere. And additionally, in the 1920s, cars are getting cheaper for, like, lower middle class can now afford them. And the automobile is going to just significantly change dating culture. Um, you now don't have to worry about your parents, like, wondering what you're doing. Like, you can just hop in a car and go where you need to go on a date. Like, that's a significant change. Um, 1920s, more casual sex. So the idea that, like, sex is not just for procreation, sex is going to be much more accepted um, casually speaking, for women, they actually enjoy it. Like that's that's a significant change. Uh, specifically in France, uh, this movement's going to increase the the, suffer, the French suffragette movement. But again, that's not going to happen until 1944. So uh, once again, I'm always looking at these from the larger perspective. Like 1920s, because of World War One, we're seeing this uh, growing um, freedom, at least socially speaking, for women. And additionally, I just want to talk a little bit about Coco Chanel because she is arguably one of the most famous fashion designers uh, in history. So Chanel's going to uh, create her label in the 1920s, 
and the styles that she creates are still like used today. For example, a lot of women today have what a quote unquote a little black dress. Historically, black dresses were used for one purpose, and that was to go to a funeral for mourning. She turns the black dress into essentially a cocktail dress, something they can use for socializing. She creates the single most famous and used fragrance in the world. Even today, it's the most fra uh, used fragrance in the world, Chanel Number no. 5. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Coco Chanel was also uh, a Nazi sympathizer. So when the German army invades France in the summer of 1940, Coco Chanel actually became a spy for the Nazis. Actually, this is just fairly recent uh, historiography where they found actual documentation that listed Coco Chanel's uh, like special agent number in the Nazi SD, which was like the, the Nazi intelligence service during World War II. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, she does get corrupted by Nazism, and, uh, you know, is, she's doing it for her own self-benefit, too, um, so she can uh, maintain her label's uh, supremacy and economic power during the time. Uh, to continue along with the theme of disillusionment from World War I, there's some literature created in the late 1920s. Uh, for example, and most famously, All Quiet on the Western Front by Eric Maria Remark, who was a German soldier during World War I. And uh, this work, again, we're looking at it from the perspective of the age of anxiety. And additionally, there's another term we could use to describe this, is the lost generation. So the Lost Generation is referring to veterans of World War I who were either killed or also the ones who survived, and they just weren't able to assimilate back into society because of, you know, all of the PTSD, the shell shock that occurred. They just didn't know how they could become functioning members of society because their brains are permanently damaged from this. So the, the term that's applied to them is called the Lost Generation. All right, so uh, again, along the lines of more irrationalism in the artwork, uh, you probably can't get more irrational than Dada uh, in the early 20th century. So Dada, uh, the easiest way to describe it is it's almost like anti-art or non-art. They're poking fun, criticizing traditional art that follows these conventions. You know, I'm sure you've always thought about like what makes artwork great like and it's generally very subjective and dada really leans into the idea of subjectivity in artwork so for example you look at the mona lisa but marcel duchamp was known for again dada and like trying to turn these artworks over and he just like draws a mustache and a little goatee on the mona lisa right uh so like is that artwork you know up to your own opinion uh, but dada asked, would say absolutely yes marcel duchamp again you can literally take a urinal, turn it upside down, put it on display, and call it art, right? That's, I mean, that's subjective. That could absolutely be art. So uh, we do see this, like, anti-art movement um, largely during and post-World War One. Picasso even did a little bit of Dada. Bicycle wheel. All right, so this section, uh, I don't see futurism come up too much on the AP exam, but it is kind of interesting just to know that it exists. So the futurists, it's exactly what it sounds like. Their influence is based on uh, further industrialization, especially as a result of World War I. And their artwork kind of like shows that like futurist idea. Uh, additionally, do know that the futurists were kind of like low-key fascists. Maybe I would even call them proto-fascists. Uh, so you're going to see in their little set of guidelines on how to be a futurist. There's one section here that says we will glorify war. We will destroy museums and libraries and acad um, academies of every kind. Like that is effectively characteristics of fascism where they worship the military. They worship um, anti-intellectualism. Um, when Mussolini takes power in Italy, and he and the futurists were, were kind of conspired, and Mussolini literally outlawed pasta in Italy! Outlawed pasta in Italy for like a year! Um, because it wasn't considered like a healthy 
food and the futurists were all about like you know well-built people athleticism things like that uh so the futurists are frankly you know a little bit strange in high sight um but again their artwork kind of just like just says futurist at least to me the cyclist here the dynamism of a car so again it's a response to these growing inventions at the time here we have airplanes to dive over the enemy sky in 1930s all right, and the last section of art, at least for this time period, is surrealism. Now, out of all these, I would say surrealism is the most important to know. Uh, once again, I'm looking at it in the context of the Age of Anxiety, that disillusionment, the lost generation from World War I. And additionally, uh, you should also keep in mind the influence of Sigmund Freud, the, the, uh, the role of the subconscious on how people act in their everyday lives. So we see a lot of almost like psychological influence in the artwork of this time called, in this case, Surrealism. So, is it rational or irrational? Hopefully I don't have to say it, but I will. It is growing irrationalism. So, Surrealism almost looks like it's a, a dream in many cases. Again, showing that connection to, to Freud and his obsession uh, with using dreams to interpret uh, personalities. So, out of all the Surrealists, you got to know Salvador Dali. Uh, probably he, maybe second, third most famous of the Spanish painters of all time, and he was absolutely a surrealist. So let's look at his most famous work, The Persistence of Memory, which people incorrectly call melting clocks, but it's called The Persistence of Memory. And again, there's so many ways to interpret this. Uh, a pretty common one, though, is think about time. Time is simply a man-made construct. It doesn't actually have connections really to nature if you think about it, simply man-made you know we're currently in debate on whether or not to get rid of daylight savings time in 2022 so it really is a construct of people and time may or may not exist at least according to dolly's interpretation here yeah <laughs> all right to round this out i'm going to talk about some inventions here uh, I'll talk about them pretty generically. So uh, radio is absolutely monumental in its importance in the 19-teens, in the 1920s, 1930s, uh, even into the 1940s, really. Radio is going to truly change the way people uh, receive, disseminate information. It's also going to kind of create common cultures, which we'll talk about in a bit. Radio is absolutely huge. So the radio... It was invented in the late 19th century. Um, most famous, one of the inventors was, of course, uh, Marconi. And the radio is going to be ridiculously important for warfare. So World War I, they did use uh, radios for communication. So think about how easy it would be to, you know, be talking to one platoon in one trench and another one uh, without having to worry about wires. So ridiculously important. But then after the war, the radio can be used for a much more, like, civilian-based um reasons so for example entertainment people are going to start creating like radio shows series uh news religion uh, propaganda is going to be ridiculously important uh, all the major fa uh, di dictators and totalitarian dictators of the 1920s and 1930s and 40s are going to use radio to disseminate their message so Mussolini in Italy, Stalin in the Soviet Union, Hitler, Nazi Germany, Francisco Franco in Spain. They're all going to use the radio to their advantage. And that's, again, one of the more important impacts of the radio is the use for propaganda. Because TV is not a thing, so how do you get out that message? It's going to be through radio. Uh, additionally, the radio is actually kind of fascinating with um, Italian uh, history. You know, as you know, Italy is, a, you know, it's a... It is a unified country in the 1920s, 1930s, but again, historically, Italians are fairly, you know, um, regionally based, and their their dialects uh, in in the Italian regions are very different to the point where a northern Italian, southern Italian, if they speak in their own dialects, they can barely understand each other. Uh, the radio actually cr uh, helps create this idea of the Italian language. Um, you don't have Italian without the radio and eventually television. So that's another idea is kind of like is um, cultural diffusion where it's creating a more seamless uh, set of values, cultures, what have you. 
All right, so that's where I'm actually going to stop this section. Uh, the next section is going to get into the economic uh, downturn of the late 1920s, leading to the rise of fascism, uh, both Italian and German. So I'm going to stop it right here and stay tuned for probably a part two. Thanks for listening.